It is good to see everybody here once again. It is a blessing to be able to gather with you. Uh, I appreciate the prayers on mine and my family's behalf as we've been suffering with some illnesses and things of this nature. Uh, as this time of year sometimes seems to, actually for the last couple of years, has <laughs> got us. Hopefully it won't be as bad as the two years previous, but we appreciate your prayers thus far. We don't have PowerPoint this morning. I thought we were going to be on the other side, so I, I took the PowerPoint and made an outline for just uh, to read out, but uh, we're, uh, we're non-PowerPoint, but uh, then we came in here, thankfully, because the men did such a good job last night in getting everything ready we were able to be in here. We appreciate them in that. Well, we are in the book of Romans, and we find ourselves, if you want to go ahead and turn there, to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, we want to, of course, remember as a way of uh, getting back to where we find ourselves, the context of where we're at. As we think of the book of Romans, there's been a great number of things by which we have realized, we have recognized, and have studied. We notice through the first eight chapters that Paul, inspired by God, as he wrote this letter in these first eight chapters, his point was trying to get the barrier between the Gentile and the Jew destroyed. That supposed divide that existed, he was trying to show them, and successfully did so, show them that there is no barrier. Remember, he points out in these eight chapters that both have sinned, they're the same. That both are in need of the gospel. That neither could be saved by any external advantage, and both could only be saved by faith in Christ. He would then go on in chapter 9 through chapter 11, which we, fi we finished up a few weeks back. He would then move to a different direction, if you will, when he would start paying attention more to the problem of physical Israel's unbelief. Remember, it was Israel, for the most part, that was causing this divine. Their baggage that they had brought in, really starting in chapter 2 and verse 1, all the way to chapter 11, 1 through 10. We see this focus on Israel because of the issues they had brought in, the baggage from their past lives. Even though they had obeyed the gospel, they were still holding on to these things. And so in chapters 9 through 11, Paul explained Israel's rejection, that of physical Israel's rejection by God, was actually just chapter 9, verses 6 through 29. He then would say in chapter 9, verse 30 through chapter 10, verse 21, that there was a good reason for Israel, physical Israel's rejection. Remember, spiritual Israel has always been God's people. Us today, we today are spiritual Israel. But physical Israel, as the Israelites had considered themselves and fought for that nationality as being a part of salvation, was a figment of their imagination. And so as Paul pointed out, God was indeed just in rejecting physical Israel. But Paul, we noticed in our last sermon on this, in the last study we had on this, Paul recognizing in chapter 11, Verse 11 and following, he recognized that the Gentiles might become conceited, might become boastful in hearing all this against the Israelites. And so in pointing out to the Gentiles the need not to boast because Israel was indeed the people of God at first. And pointing out that they too, though grafted in, could find themselves being severed like physical Israel they need to make sure that they went to their brethren and encouraged them and helped them. That they were there with them, not being divided, but being united. <clears throat> well, that brings us, doesn't it, to chapter 12. Paul changes directions again. In chapter 1 through chapter 11, Paul is dealing with doctrinal issues. He's dealing with those teachings that they needed to grasp, like in chapter 4, how all are saved by faith. Like chapter 3, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Chapter 6, though we have sinned and sinned, one sin brings about death. God has given us a free gift, hasn't he? 
And so he's dealing with doctrinal issues in these first 11 chapters. But in chapter 12, he shifts from the doctrinal issues. And don't get me wrong, these are teachings that we need to abide by. But more to practical lessons based on these first 11 chapters. That's why chapter 12 starts with therefore. In the first few words or sentence there. The word therefore means, as Brother Waycaster pointed out here in chapter 12 and verse 1, therefore shows that there is a vital connection between the doctrine that went before and the exhortations that are to follow. And so today we begin here in chapter 12, which some have deemed James in a chapter. The practical lessons that are found here in chapter 12, one could spend years looking at. Now, we're not going to spend years on it, but we are going to spend three weeks looking at the different lessons that are found here because there are so much, there is so much beautiful and wonderful teachings in this particular chapter. It would behoove us to move through it too quickly. And so with that in mind, let's go ahead and let's look <coughs> at our text this morning. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you have your Bible. Let's read these first two verses here. Paul writes to them, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Brothers and sisters, as we look at this, the first point, and if you have your hand out, we're going to examine, is this idea of a living sacrifice. This idea of a living sacrifice is what we often find in Scripture. It is sometimes called an oxymoron in the sense that it seems to be contradictory itself. How can we have a sacrifice, and a sacrifice meaning putting to end something, putting to death something, how can we have a living death? But as we see in Scripture, there, are always, there is always a reason, isn't there? For God to put together words in His infinite wisdom that really pushes us towards the boundaries of recognizing how truly wonderful and amazing He is and the expectations He has for us. And so He says here, Paul to the Roman brethren and by extension to us as we'll see. He says to them, listen, you are to be because of these doctrinal things that we have discussed, because you have been saved by faith, because you are walking in this newness of life, because of all these things, you need to be a living sacrifice. But what exactly does that mean? The key to understanding this is back actually with the word present. Because the word present is important. Notice what it says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now what makes this word significant is that it is actually in the aorist tense. What that means, what that typically means, almost always, is that it's dealing with a singular one-time act. In other words, God is not saying to present yourself over and over and over as a living sacrifice. Now, as we'll notice, there are some lasting effects of this, but that's not the focus here. The focus is a one-time gift, a one-time uh, situation, if you will. And so this isn't talking about becoming a child of God either. Remember, these are children of God already. They have already been saved or justified by faith. They have already been baptized into Christ, Romans chapter 6. Romans 8, they have the Holy Spirit and thus are a part of the body of Christ, Romans chapter 8. And so these are not non-Christians. Paul's not talking about becoming a child of God here. No, we are as children of God to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And so when we think about this and we look at this, God is trying 
to get the brethren here at Rome, those who have been divided. He's trying to get the brethren there to understand that they were supposed to bring a gift of appreciation for having been saved by faith. Remember, this is based on, the therefore it's based on those doctrinal issues. Paul says, because you have been saved, you were to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, as a gift. And remember, the sacrifices under the old law, they were a gift to God, weren't they? They were a, an act, a gift of, our, of their worship to God. An act by which they performed or had performed on their behalf to please God, whether it be for uh, preventative things, past things, or what was presently needed. And so when we look at this concept, we see that this gift, this gift that is presented to God is a living sacrifice. It is their life, in other words. Isn't that what God talks about throughout the New Testament? Isn't that what Jesus was trying to get the disciples to understand? Luke chapter 9, verse 23, you're going to have to take up your cross daily. You're going to have to be not yourself, but me. You're going to have to be, Matthew chapter 5, 11, a light, my light to a lost and dying world. As Paul would say, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. You see, when we obey the gospel, when these brethren had obeyed the gospel, God accept, is, expects us to present ourselves to him as a gift. He expects us not to live for our own earthly wants and desires, but to live for him. But as we look at our text here, it says that this living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable to God, is, notice ESV, your spiritual worship. New King James and King James says reasonable service. The American standard there says spiritual service. The updated 1995 New American Standard says spiritual act. Of worship. What we see is here there's some uh, question about how exactly to pull all these words together, these two words together. And so I want us to look at that because this sacrifice, this living sacrifice that we are to give to God when we have obeyed the gospel, <coughs> it is this spiritual worship. It is what we do, it is who we are, as we'll notice. Let's look at the word spiritual first, as seen in the ESV there. And most, or reasonable, depending on your translation. Maybe. Let's look at that particular word. You see, this word is found only two times in all of the New Testament. It's found here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, and it's also found in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, we remember what Peter wrote there. He says, like newborn infants long for the spiritual or pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. <coughs> Excuse me. There are several words in the New Testament where this word spiritual is translated in English, but it, this particular word is only found here in Romans 12.1. And 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, and the word itself, if you break it down into what it literally means, it literally means to carefully, thoughtfully, and thoroughly make a rational decision. Make a reasonable, logical decision based on forethought, based on careful attention to. And so we see here this living sacrifice, first and foremost, it has to deal with what we're to do. It has to deal with paying close attention, doesn't it? Mentally being prepared and focused where it needs to be. Now let's look at that next word, worship. Because the living sacrifice is this carefully thought out, reasonable, rational worship, as it's translated in the ESV service and some of the other translations. Now, this word, service, or worship, is only found five times in the New Testament. 
In your handout, there's listed all five times, starting in John 16 and verse 2, going through Hebrews 9 and verse 6, that section there. Every single time we see this particular word for worship or service. Now, this word literally means a divine service, as in the performance of religious duties. A divine service, as in the performance of religious duties. Those things that God has commanded us to religiously hold to. Hence the idea of service, worship, a servanthood of worship, things along those lines. Now, when, Ro when the Roman brethren obeyed the gospel, just like us, they were expected, as we saw, to give God the gift of their lives. To sacrifice their own lives, to crucify that old man of sin. Remember Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. To crucify that self and be perfectly there for God. Wholly open to him and his word through obedience. Now this living sacrifice that we give to God, that we offer ourselves to God having received his grace and our sins washed away. <clears throat> this living sacrifice, this gift we give to God, would be witnessed daily by God. Even though we are to one time sacrifice ourselves to him. To go to the Father and say, listen, I give my all to you. That act or that gift should be seen in our lives all the time, shouldn't it? It should be witnessed by God. Paul is trying to get them to understand. When you gave your life to God, Paul says, God should see that in your life. He should see that in the things in which you do. He should see this in you and others should see it in how you carefully and thoughtfully make acts of service to God. In other words, how you worship Him, but not beholden to that alone, but how you serve Him on daily tasks. God should witness, and others should see it. That's why, remember, I think it's important when we see they were first called Christians, what at Antioch? By what? Their service. They were seen to be Christ-like. Because they were, as all should be, thinking carefully on how they should act upon the requirements of God. Now, God expects, just like he expected it from the Romans, he expects the same thing from us, doesn't he? <clears throat> That's why some have called Romans 12, like we said, the, the book of James. James is the practical application of the scriptures, isn't it? It is that... The, the thing that the great, wonderful letter that Jesus' brother wrote, inspired by God, to give us so many practical lessons on how to live in our daily lives. How to interact with each other, how to be around each other, how to uh, uplift each other, all these kinds of things, how to behave. And when we look at Romans 12, Paul's starting out saying the same thing. God should witness these things in our lives. He should see them, in other words, and others should as well. And God expects the same from us. Now, I thought of a verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, that encapsulates this concept. I know it's dealing with the, in context, it's dealing with false doctrine. But there's a phrase in 2 Corinthians 10, 5 that says we are to take every thought captive to obey Christ. And like I said, I understand the context is dealing with <laughs> false doctrine to take those things that are false and make them captive to Christ and be obedient to it. But the concept still falls in line. That idea falls in line, doesn't it? With what God or Paul here is saying to the Romans. When you sacrifice your life, you're to take captive every thought and place it in its proper place in a direction towards obedience to Christ. It's through careful and uh, carefully and thoughtfully thinking about each action, we will be holy and acceptable to God. Remember what that living sacrifice is. It is holy 
and acceptable. Paul has said clearly that as children of God, if we want to be holy and acceptable to Him, we must be this living sacrifice. Meaning we must thought thoroughly, thoughtfully, and carefully contemplate the expectations of God and live by them. Let's go ahead now, Paul having explained that, and look at our second point here. Paul, in explaining this important truth, how to be holy and acceptable to God, as children of His, Paul then, inspired by God, explains that the way they were to uphold their gift to God is staying transformed, isn't it? Now let's look at verse 2 there again. Do not, Paul says, be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, their transformation was when they obeyed the gospel. Just like for us today, we are transformed. When we obey the gospel. In fact, Paul would say to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, they have become made a new creation, right? All those who obey the gospel, all those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, <coughs> and who have put on, put away the old man of flesh and put on righteousness, been clothed with Christ, Galatians 3:27. All those that have done that have been transformed. They have been made a new creation. Now, being a new creation, Paul says, as a new creation, these brethren were expected to walk accordingly. Walk like they were new, not like they were in the past. Now, why would Paul say that? Remember the context. The Jews and the Gentiles, chapter 1 to some degree, they were bringing in some of their baggage with them, weren't they? They were not walking according to their new lives, holy and free, but walking somewhat according to their past lives, bringing in these things. And so Paul explains that this walk, this new walk which they have found themselves in, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, remember, in the same way Christ was raised, remember, they were to walk in this newness of life, Romans 6, 4. Paul then says, listen, this walk is done by proving what is the will of God. That word proving, ESV says discerning. That word proving is a powerful, powerful word. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, we're told to prove all things, aren't we? Hold fast to that which is good. How does one prove what is the will of God? That's the age-old question, isn't it? People have been asking that for years. How do we know what is God's will? The Jews, you can imagine these Jewish children of God who have just had Paul shatter all these misconceptions they've had all these years, all these things that were really the foundation of their strength in many ways. You can imagine them saying, well, how do we do this? Paul answers some of those questions from time to time. You can imagine, how do we do this? And Paul says, listen, here's how you walk in this newness of life. Here's how you prove what is the will of God. You find everything that is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, understand these conjunctions, the conjunction and is found with each of those, isn't it? It doesn't say you can find something good and it's the will of God or just something acceptable and it's the will of God or just something perfect and it's the will of God. No, he says all three are required. If it is good, if it is acceptable by God, and if it is perfect, then it is the will of God. What a powerful statement on study. God's will will always have all three. If we want to know, and you've heard me say before, and some of you have reiterated this fact, if we want to know the will of God, then we take the doctrines that we hear, the teachings we hear, and we look at the scriptures to see if it's so. And if we find holes in them, then we cannot guarantee it's the will of God, can we? Because we can't guarantee it's perfect. 
If it's not good or acceptable or perfect, it's not the will of God. We can't hold to it. Some have asked, well, there are some things in the scriptures, and are you worried about some of the things in the scriptures where we don't seem to have the perfect answer for everything? And the answer is no, because God has given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness, hasn't he? Everything that will get us to heaven or send us to hell, he has told us about. That doesn't mean we ignore other things, but we want to stand on truth always as a good example. This is I always use this illustration, as you guys know. We know the will of God is that when we obey the gospel, the Holy Spirit dwells with us. Now, how that takes place, whether it's representative or literal, we're not given all the information. There are holes you can pick in each of those. For someone to say they are guaranteeing the will of God is a literal or figurative, they're speaking out of turn. Because they can't prove that it's good, acceptable, and perfect. But what we can prove is that the Holy Spirit does well, Romans chapter 8, in every single child of God. That is the will of God. That's what we know. And so when we see this, when we look at this, to tie everything together on this, everyone that, obey, that has obeyed the gospel is expected to give their living sacrifice to God, their gift to Him. He's given us the free gift of Christ. And now having obeyed him, he expects us to give our lives to him. To do so means that we are willing to carefully and thoroughly serve God according to his word. And the only way we can serve thoroughly and worship thoroughly our God is if we are continually being transformed by the renewal of our mind. In other words, we're not satisfied with where we're at. We're continually growing developing in God's Word. And this happens, obviously, by proving the will of God. It all ties together, doesn't it? It all comes together nicely. Everything Paul has talked about in these 11 chapters, he sums up, really, in these two verses. The practical application. Now, he's going to, in the next couple of uh, sections here, how all that goes together. Examples, illustrations, if you will, of how we live that sacrifice. How we live daily in our, in our uh, examples to those around us. But here, what a beautiful and powerful passage. And what it means to be wonderfully, beautifully made as a new creation. A sacrificed soul who takes up his cross daily. Maybe it is the case that there's someone here. Reflecting upon this, maybe there's someone here who's been dealing with a challenge. A struggle in life. Maybe you haven't. You never gave that true gift to God. Or maybe you've taken it back. We can do that, can't we? There are those who have given them their lives over in service only to eventually fall away. If you find yourself having done that, make the change. If you find yourself having one time been a gift to God, a living sacrifice, but now having walked on your own path in your own way, make the change. If you'd like us to pray for you, and I recommend it, to pray for you and be there for you, encourage you in that, then let us know. Maybe there's someone here who's dealing with a different challenge, a different difficulty. Maybe they're dealing with an emotional issue that they're going through, a trial. If that's the case, we pray that it will relieve itself soon, that it will be over, but... We also encourage you to take heart in your family here. So if there is someone here who needs the prayers of this congregation in either way, let us know today. And let us help you by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.